Welcome everyone to our Innovations in, tobacco, in Global Tobacco Control Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Joanna Cohn. I'm Director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's Innovations Lecturer, Dr. Jorg Matt. Uh, he is a Professor of Psychology in the College of Sciences at San Diego State University. He's also a faculty member at the Moore's Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of California, San Diego. And he's director of the Third Hand Smoke Resource Center. Now for the past couple of decades, Dr. Matt's research has focused on human exposure to tobacco smoke toxicants in field settings. And to do that, he brings cross disciplinary expertise to examine the complex and dynamic mixtures of tobacco smoke compounds and tobacco product waste in actual real life settings. He also looks at human behavior associated with exposure and the policies to better protect the public from exposure to tobacco smoke pollutants and the environment. And I have to say, as an editor of a journal, I was always excited to receive a paper from Dr. Matt. He has um, been very creative and, uh, and done innovative work in particular around um, third hand smoke and rental cars, third hand smoke and hotel rooms, always really interesting work. And I'm so glad that he's here to talk with us today about third hand smoke. So Dr. Matt, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Joanna, for inviting me. Um, just a funny side note, somebody called me recently the human smoke detector because I've been doing this research in so many different set settings. So today I will tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing and others have been doing on the topic of third hand smoke, the persistent toxic and very costly legacy of commercial tobacco uh, use. And before we start, I want to acknowledge important contributors to this work. First and foremost, the California Tobacco Related Disease Research Program, who has been funding these studies in, in hotel rooms and rental cars and a uh, casino uh, for the past 20 plus years. The US Department of Housing and Urban Development um, has funded some of our work, more recently also NIH, um, National Institutes of Environmental Health. And I need to thank especially colleagues and collaborators in the California Collaborative Third and Smoke Research Consortium and I think if you look at the names, you probably recognize some of the names uh, because we've been lucky to work with some of the smartest and um, nicest persons in the field to do this work. There are a ton of students involved and literally thousands of research participants um, who allowed us to come into their homes and collect data on them and uh, answer many of our questions. I'll be starting out today with just defining and uh, illustrating what is third hand smoke. Um, I'll then take um, several slides to give you a brief and very selective review of third hand smoke research, because it's been a very interesting uh, research program with many different interdisciplinary connections and uh, interesting stories along the way. I'll then um, come to an important topic, uh, we published a paper recently in Tobacco Control pointing out policy relevant differences between secondhand and third hand smoke to illustrate how we may have to update some of our existing policies to address some of the concerns uh, raised by third hand smoke. And finally, I'll talk about some of the regulatory and policy implications as we see them based on this research. So what is third hand smoke? Well, here is a scientific definition that we've uh, published some 12 years ago. Third hand smoke is a complex, dynamic, persistent and toxic mixture of tobacco smoke pollutants generated from secondhand smoke that remains on surfaces. It's very sticky. It collects in dust and it becomes embedded in objects, including 
uh, upholstery, carpets, as well as drywall. It gets re-emitted from these reservoirs into the gas phase uh, that, um, and um, gets back into the air. It can get resuspended from accumulated fine and ultra fine dust deposits. And very importantly, it continues to age. It reacts with oxidants and other compounds in the environment to yield secondary and tertiary pollutants, something known as chemical aging. And we'll, uh, I'll, you'll learn more about this in a little bit. This topic has been known for a while, but not under the name third hand smoke. And um, so here are some of the other names that this issue has uh, uh, been referred to. Tobacco smoke residue, stale tobacco smoke, aged tobacco smoke, cold tobacco smoke. And it is a close relative to what has been studied for a while, tobacco smoke condensate. So that was the scientific definition. I want to show you now a few images to get you in the, in the mood. Um, so here's kind of the process. We have secondhand smoke. It um, attaches and sticks to, it remains, it gets resuspended, re-emitted, and reacts. And this is what this looks like after a while. Here is a room um, where someone or several people smoked for a long period of time, and you see this uh, characteristic brownish, orangey residue. But it's not just a discoloration. These are layers of chemical compounds. Uh, and it's not just on the surface. They get into the carpet fibers, the carpet backing. They go into the drywall. They go behind the drywall into the insulation. They go into utility ducts. This is what plates might look like um, that have been in a cupboard. So the smoke gets easily into cupboards. When you wipe it off, you might be able to remove some of the outer layer. Well, here is an object that's harder to wipe off because dirt and smoke gets deep into the upholstery and into toys. And here is a young smoker who realized that her clothes stink. Well, that is dirt and smoke. And importantly, as you'll find out as well, it sticks to you. And by you, it's your skin, your hair. Um, if you have artwork, that's what it might look like. If you're a dentist, um, this is what you might see. And if you've been a smoker or you know someone who smokes, you may have noticed this coloration on the fingers that are closest to the cigarette or that hold the cigarette. This is third hand smoke. And it's not just a color you can wipe off because if you've ever um, tried to wash this off, you see it's not gonna wipe off because it has become embedded in the dermis and the skin outer layer. And so it stays there. So where does this third hand smoke come from? So as people smoke, they inhale what's known as mainstream smoke. And what comes off from the smoldering tip is referred to as side stream smoke. Oops, wrong direction. So we call, or we could call first-hand smoke, the active, active smoking. The primary exposure pathway is inhaling mainstream smoke. The composition of that mainstream smoke depends on the cigarette, the uh, uh, smoking topography, puff volume, frequency, how smokers inhale. We know that this mainstream smoke includes a large mixture of different chemicals. Some are in gas form and others are in particle form. Some are very volatile, the VOCs. Some are semi-volatile. They can um, change from gas phase to particle phase. The particles are super fine and get into any gaps that there might be. Tobacco smoke makes up about 0.4 to 0.7 gram of a cigarette. Time scale, well, uh, to smoke one cigarette, maybe five to 10 minutes, 15 to 25 puffs. The affected party is the first hand smoker. Now let's come to second hand smoke. Second hand smoke is actually an interesting new development because the majority of the secondhand smoke is actually side stream smoke. And only about 15% is made up by the exhaled mainstream smoke. Primary exposure pathway to secondhand smoke is inhaling this mixture of mainstream and side stream smoke. Mainstream and side stream smoke contain many of the same compounds, but there are important differences. 
tobacco burns at lower temperature when it is not inhaled, when it just smolders. This lower temperature leads to incomplete combustion. This leads to higher concentrations of toxic gases and particles. So the so tobacco smoke, that's this mixture, is actually more toxic. Secondary smoke is more toxic overall than the mainstream smoke that's being inhaled. It produces smaller particles, which also makes it more toxic. Secondhand smoke can travel through a room, a home, neighboring apartments, entire buildings. We know it's a big issue in multi-unit housing, so it can affect many more people. The time scale is longer than just active smoking, and it depends on air exchanges. So it could be maybe 10 minutes all the way up to perhaps even a couple hours. And because of these properties, it affects a larger number of people in the proximity of active smokers or living in a building. Now, after first and second comes third hand smoke. So third hand smoke, as you already know, is that stuff, that chemical mixture that remains on surfaces. Think of this, this, uh, this home where people smoke you know, that couch, it gets re-emitted into the gas phase. Sometimes we can smell it if the off-gassing involves odorant compounds, but other times we cannot. Um, particles might be resuspended, or the gas phase compounds might condense and combine with particles, and it can react with oxidants. It undergoes chemical changes. So here is a, a chart that shows some of this the deposition, the re-emission, and then in the presence of ambient oxidants like ozone or uh, nitrous acids, um, we can have reactions that create novel compounds. Exposure pathways, and that's an important distinction. Exposure pathways involve inhalation of re-emitted compounds, but it can also involve ingestion of dust and polluted objects. And if you're in environmental health, you know that ingestion of dust is an important source of exposure, especially in children. Dolls and adults. And then finally, dermal uptake, a very underrecognized source of exposure uh, for secondhand smoke as well as for uh, thirdhand smoke. And dermal uptake can uh, take on directly from the air, <clears throat> from clothes, from surfaces. The exposure profile, I think, makes a big difference as well. Because if you live in a home that has been thirdhand smoke uh, polluted, your exposure will be 24 7. It will be chronic. The time scale is not just uh, occasional episodes, but it is 24 seven for weeks, for months, for years. And if it involves um, an environment where there is a lot of turnover, like hotel rooms or rental cars or apartments, it can affect a large number of people who come in contact in these uh, polluted places. So what is in third and smoke? This is a table that I've copied from our uh, recent tobacco control paper. It includes a long list of compounds that if you're in the tobacco field, look very familiar because they are part of mainstream smoke, they're part of uh, side stream smoke, they're part of secondhand smoke. They are a part of this mixture that is persistent and over time. It just doesn't go away. It collects in dust on surfaces, and here are some of the prominent ones. They're all part of California's Prop 65 listing. Prop 65 lists chemicals that can cause cancer uh, as well as devel developmental and reproductive harm. And um, the ones I've listed here are also classified under uh, the IRC, IARC classification. Um, so you see, and I'm just not going to name a few because the names will come up later again, uh, something like benzene and benzoatyrene, formaldehyde, cadmium, um, so they're in inorganic compounds as well, NNK, NNN, tobacco-specific nitrosamines, styrene, PAHs, you name it, a lot of PAHs in there, uh, and then further down, lead, there's an interesting paper that will come out very soon about the significant contribution of tobacco smoke to lead in house dust, naphthalene, pyrene, and of course, nicotine. So 
I want to start now with a brief review of the research um, that has led to where we are now. And it starts in my in the story that I'm telling here in 1939, when at a research um, laboratory in Buenos Aires, somebody studied um, what was then called and still is called tobacco tar, the condensate of uh, tobacco smoke. So this is the study. Interestingly, it was published in German, um, in and um, it um, involved um, applying tobacco tar, that is the condensate of tobacco smoke, to the ears of seventeen rabbits. And what happened was that these these rabbits developed carcinomas. Um, that was the first time where, um, as far as we can go back, somebody conducted a scientific story, a, a st st study to uh, investigate not just inhalation cost harm, but harm through the application and uptake through the skin. Um, and moving forward 20 years, in the mid-1950s, and you have seen some of these studies, Ernest Winder, did a series of similar studies, not involving rabbits, but this time, this time mice. And he applied, again, tobacco smoke condensate to the skin of rabbits. And uh, to no one's surprise, certainly not to ours, these um, mice developed uh, uh, papillomas, uh, carcinomas, and um, um, he was able to show this across different strain of mice and across different dosages of application. The tobacco industry, um, we're now in the 1970s, was very concerned with um, the odor of stale tobacco smoke. And they conducted a series of studies to better understand what causes the odor, because it's very unpleasant. It's a, a, an obnoxious odor, and a lot of smokers and non-smokers dislike it a lot. And they were hoping that they could reduce or eliminate the problem by identifying which compounds are involved and then perhaps removing these compounds. Um, they've not been able to accomplish their goal, but in their analyses in the mid-late 1970s, they um, studied what causes this off-gassing. And here are some of the names you've probably seen on my listing of certain smoke constituents. Um, including nicotine, myosmine, these are uh, tobacco aldehydes, pyridine. Um, here are some more. Um, oops. Um, benzene, um, ethylbenzene, naphtaline, we've seen before. So um, there was a recognition in the tobacco industry that this is this certain smoke, the off gassing, the smell in particular was um, harmful to their business model, and uh, but they did not succeed to uh, get rid of this order or address this in any meaningful way. So this is the 1970s, and here is a study that blew my mind, I have to say it this way, because it was just mind-boggling to learn this. So this is a study that was conducted in the 1990s in a secret laboratory in Germany, a Philip Morris laboratory. And what Philip Morris did was they collected data in a controlled environment. They ran side stream smoke through this uh, room for eight hours a day for 110 days. The room was a 30 cubic meter uh, room. Um, it was ventilated at night. And then they examined nicotine as well as NNK, a carcinogen that causes lung cancer, for 111 days after the last cigarette was extinguished. What they found was that the amount of carcinogenic uh, nitrosamine, NNK, that persists months after smoking ends can exceed the amount that actually came out of the cigarettes. And I want to show you that table because that was just crazy to see. So we see here, the amount that was input in the room, so 42 grams of nic nicotine, that's a huge amount of nicotine. This is what was exhausted. This is what deposited on the surfaces, and this is what was recovered. So for nicotine, they recovered um, 
on the surfaces, 60%. But for NNK, they input 12 micrograms, crazy large amount. They exhausted five. They found on the surfaces, 15. That is, they recovered a total, they could account for a total of 170%. How is that possible? Is it magic? Well, if you think chemistry is, is magic, then it is, but it is really chemistry. And you'll see this in later studies that um, the aging of uh, tobacco smoke um, is dynamic. And in the presence of uh, ambient oxidants, nicotine in particular, can be converted into tobacco-specific nitrosamines, into even more toxic compounds. So the fact that there was only 60% recovered in nicotine, some of the, the, uh, the, the compounds that were not recovered were turned into carcinogenic uh, NNK. So this is a study that was done in the 1990s. It was not published until Suzanne Schick, uh, a certain smoke consortium member, uh, came across it and published this very important paper in 2019, uh, bringing this study to light. Uh, we're back in the early 1990s, um, and it was Hans Olhein, I think a researcher from Denmark, who for the first time noticed that nicotine can be found in the dust of smokers. And uh, he concluded that it is possible for people to get exposed, even if nobody smokes around them. That was the first field study that was published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal, and that was in 1991. Did not attract a lot of attention immediately. I certainly didn't, didn't read it right, right away, but I came across it later. But an important program of research was started in the 1990s by Joan Daisy, a terrific researcher at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab um, up in uh, San Francisco, and she examined what happens to tobacco smoke. And I'm highlighting here a few things that um, were remarkable to me. She found out that about 80 to 90% of nicotine in the air was deposited and sorbed on the surfaces within the first one to two hours after the nicotine was emitted into the chamber. So the nicotine was, didn't disappear because it was inhaled or because it was blown up, it was ventilated out. It, a large proportion, immediately stuck to, deposited, absorbed to surfaces. Um, she looked at which surfaces were particularly um, uh, sorptive and she found that the carpet sorbed approximately 100 times more nicotine per square meter than did the stainless steel walls. So that's remarkable for two reasons. One is nicotine sorbs to stainless steel walls. Yes, it does. So in their chamber, um, they, use a, um, they use stainless steel walls in order to prevent this kind of thing from happening and to facilitate cleaning. But even more remarkable is that carpets are particularly uh, deep and receptive reservoirs for many of the compounds that one finds in tobacco smoke. Um, so she found that this suggests that there are two sinks, one rapid sink and one that's dominated by um, the surface and then a second sink, a second reservoir, slower sink that's controlled by diffusion into the polymer. So uh, the surface reservoir would be, uh, the, the surface dominated reservoir would be what sticks to the outside, let's say of the stainless steel wall and the slower that goes deep into the materials, including carpets, but as you'll see other materials as well. Um, here is somebody in um, Joan Daisy's group, Brett S Singer. And it was Brett Singer who um, I met about this time in 2002, who, uh, replicated some of this work and found that it's not just nicotine, but um, 40 to 70 percent of phenols, cresols, naphthalene, um, um, gets sorbed and remains behind in these environments as well. And almost all of the sorbed nicotine uh, remains there for three days after smoking. 
And he mentions three days because this is when they stop the experiment. As you'll see, it stays for much, much longer. This is the first paper that we published on the topic, and we didn't dare to call it Third and Smoke. I first heard the term Third and Smoke from Brett Singer around this time, and I thought it was too slick. Second and Smoke, Third and Smoke. We need to be more scientific about it. So we called it at that time tobacco smoke residue. And we found that it is very difficult for parents to protect their children from tobacco smoke, even if they smoke outdoors. So we concluded that infants of smoker are, smokers are at risk of second smoke exposure through dust, through surfaces and air. Smoking outside the home and away from uh, the infants does not completely protect a smoker's home. And we now know the reason for it because the residue that's being left behind in the home, the transport of uh, chemicals into smoke-free environments. Um, here is um, a um, copy of a USA Today article in 2006. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up here is because this is the first time the term third and smoke appeared in print. And if you have seen it earlier and can provide um, me a copy of this, please let me know because I'm trying to find out when did it first appear. And um, at that, in that year, in that summer of 2006, I um, was contacted by Liz uh, Shabo uh, from USA Today. And I uh, talked with her about the study we had published about children exposure. And I mentioned to her that some people are now calling this 13 smoke. So 2006, almost 20 years that uh, this term has been in use. Here's another great paper by Susan Schick. Um, on a similar topic and um, an important finding. She demonstrated again, or she, she dug up again, a study that was conducted at one of the uh, Philip Morris uh, laboratories. And she found out that as tobacco smoke ages, it becomes more toxic. That kind of links back to the 1991 study where um, you just saw that over time, the amount of uh, um, tobacco-specific nitrosamine NNK can actually exceed the amount that was present in fresh tobacco smoke. So that's a really important finding that this residue is not just a nuisance, but this residue is a toxic mixture that can get more toxic over time. And another um, humorous side story here, a few years after this, we tried to publish, and Joanna might be interested in this, we, we submitted our paper on rental cars, so just smoking rental cars, and one of the reviewers wrote us back, um, this strikes me as not worse than spilled coffee. So um, I think that view has changed over the time, but back then in the um, mid 2000s, um, I think there was some concern about, is it really a big deal? It's just a bad odor. It's just a discoloration, but this is the work that demonstrated that it is way more. Um, here is a paper, uh, 2009, I believe, that received quite a bit of attention. Jonathan Winnikoff, who many of you, I believe, know, uh, published a paper in which he reviewed um, the beliefs about health effects of third and smoke. The paper drew uh, quite a bit of attention and it actually contributed to um, the fact that third hand smoke, this topic became one of the ideas of the year in 2009 that the New York Times publishes every year. So this was, I think, when third hand smoke entered kind of popular press and popular discourse and um, has increased in uh, visibility and use um, ever since then. Um, the Lawrence Berkeley Group, as you know, has played a major role in this, and you see some additional um, players, uh, Mohamed Sliman, Laura Gundel, um, Jim Panko, uh, Peyton Jacob, Brett Singer, and U Ugo, um, finally published a paper where they demonstrated that 
carcinogen, new carcinogens can form by surface mediated reactions with nicotine based on ambient oxidants. So um, for chemists in the audience, uh, nicotine on the left-hand side can react with nitrous acids and then creates new products. So NNN and NNK are tobacco-specific nitrosamines, carcinogens that are present in uh, mainstream smoke. And then there is NNA. NNK is a novel uh, tobacco-specific nitrosamine that is not present in freshly emitted tobacco smoke, but that is one of the chemical aging uh, products that are being created. And um, um, 2009, 2010, uh, TRDRP decided to fund the Third and Smoke Research Consortium. That is a multi-institutional, truly multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, translational research effort. And we were just recently refunded in phase four. So we had four phases, 22, 2025. And this is, these are the kind of projects that we're doing. We have um, serious uh, chemistry uh, studies and studies of the remediation. How can we clean up dirt and smoke? Uh, Antoine Snyder uh, is studying the genotoxicity and susceptibility in animal models. Uh, Suzanne Schick uh, is conducting control human exposure studies and with a focus particularly on the role of the skin and dermal exposure. Um, Jenny Quintana and our good colleague Melinda Mahabi Gittens at Cincinnati Children's Hospital is studying clinical markers of harm. Um, Nate Daughter is looking at the fate of tobacco smoke in indoor environments, and Rachel Record is studying messaging. We have uh, uh, important cores um, that support these studies on biomarkers, environmental markers, certain smoke generation, then our resource center, and we offer pilot projects as well. Um, a few more studies that have played a major role here, 2011, we have um, our first review paper in which we define third and smoke. The definition were the three R's that I gave you at the very beginning. Um, here are a series of studies that examined the genome and cytotoxicity of um, third and smoke mixtures, mostly in vitro studies, but some were also conducted in animal studies, um, demonstrating that exposure to third and smoke at dosages similar to what one finds in um, natural environments. Certain smoke can cause DNA breaks. It can interfere with um, the um, um, healthy cycle of uh, cell generation and cell death. It um, can cause cell death. It can cause um, stress-induced mitochondrial hyperfusion. And um, so we now understand some of the mechanisms in which uh, certain smoke can cause harm. And because it involves some of the same compounds, some of the mechanisms are very similar to uh, those mechanisms one uh, we've already understand for smoking as well as for secondhand smoke. Um, uh, uh, US Department of Housing and Urban Development got interested in this because they are in charge of a lot of multi-unit housing. And um, this was just before they imposed um, a smoking ban in, in uh, multi-unit housing. And uh, so we were able to do some of the research um, in multi-unit housing. And I just wanna show you this graph here where we studied 220 low-income units in San Diego. We have on the x-axis, the 220 homes. On the y-axis, we have surface nicotine concentration a common measure of third and smoke. And you can see that we found nicotine in each and every home that we visited. You see in light and dark blue, the homes of non-smokers and in red, the homes of smokers. And I wanna draw your attention to four cases um, that showed excessive levels. Here is someone who's been living in uh, her home with a smoking ban for 10 years, never smoked, has a smoking ban, 
220 micrograms per square meter. This is a level that we typically find in a smoking casino uh, or in a smoker hotel room. Here is another person, uh, again, a non-smoker lived in an apartment for two years, 550. Uh, 2,500, this is a, an extraordinary high level. Here is someone who lived in this apartment for 10 years, a non-smoker, but his wife smoked. Um, she passed away three and a half years ago, and this is some of the legacy that's left behind. And the highest level was not found in the home of a smoker, but in the home of a non-smoker, someone who had quit smoking nine years ago. Um, before that, um, was a heavy smoker and had lived in this apartment for 21 years. You can see that's a really persistent as well as pervasive uh, problem. Um, I'm going to go through the study really quickly. This is a study that was done in a movie theater, in a non-smoking movie theater, um, where um, uh, Drew Gentner and his team at Yale um, used real-time um, um, air samples to measure the emissions and re-emissions of tobacco smoke pollutants in the smoke-free movie theater. There were movies shown during the day, family movies, in the night, more adult type movies. They demonstrated the increase of emissions through transport during the adult mo movies. And then they found that the VOC emissions exposed occupants in the smoke-free uh, theater to the equivalent of one to 10 cigarettes of secondhand smoke, including multiple hazardous air components such as benzene and formaldehyde. So how could this happen? Well, it happens because this movie theater is frequented by smokers who may have just smoked before they came in. As they come in, they transport pollutants on their clothes, on their breath, on their skin, they bring it into the smoke-free environment where the pollutants stay behind. So you see here the equivalent in uh, cigarettes exposed to, uh, to uh, secondhand smoke exposure of cigarettes of various um, hazardous compounds, including naphthalene and benzene and acrolyne. So uh, um, <laughs> certain smoke is um, not just found in homes where people actively smoked, but also where people transported um, these compounds. Um, and since um, remediation is an important issue, if, these, if, there's, if there are homes that are polluted, what can we do with remediation? And uh, so the Lawrence um, Berkeley group uh, studied ozonation. Um, what can we do with ozonation? So they brought into their stainless, uh, stainless steel chamber a polluted uh, piece of carpet right here. And over the next 10 days, they noticed that through the re-emissions from the carpet, nicotine went up and it finally stabilized at a level. Then they did their first ozonation. The level dipped down a little bit and then they recovered. Um, they did a second, um, more extensive ozonation, and the levels went down, but they did not significantly um, differ from the earlier levels. They then smoked another cigarette, nicotine in the chamber, the nicotine levels went up, they ozonated, and um, the levels went down a little bit, but kind of reestablished at the same level as there, as there was before. Now, alarmingly, this is what happened to the nicotine. This is what happened to um, some of the volatile organic compounds. As the carpet was placed in the chamber, um, VOCs increased. They stayed pretty much the same after the first ozonation, but then after the heavy dose ozonation, they actually increased. This happens now, and you will understand this because Ozonation, O3, is a very strong oxidant that induces chemical reactions that actually led to an increase in VOCs and didn't make them disappear, it increased it. And then examining the actual back, the actual materials, the actual carpet, you can see at the various stages where carpet samples were taken, the amount of um, uh, nicotine that was found in the backing as well as in the fibers on top 
pretty much stayed the same. So this is a pretty depressing finding if the hope is that ocean can save the day and clean up these environments. Uh, it doesn't look like it. And then the last study I want to share with you is a study we did with our colleagues in Cincinnati, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, where we wiped the hands of children, uh, children 12 years and younger. They're all um, living in low-income homes. Some were in protected environments. That's the blue colored um, um, lines here or columns. And then uh, some lived in homes that allowed for smoking. We found nicotine on the hands of 95% of the protected children, 97% of the unprotected children. And you can see here that um, children that are less protected have higher levels, but you can see that the levels are, um, there are protected children, non-smoking, uh, children from non-smoking homes uh, scattered throughout this. So how do children get exposed to um, nic nicotine on their hands? Well, they get exposed through touching objects, through um, interacting with the environment, through playing, through just being children. And um, of course, um, all of these children, all of the children in these protected homes were children of parents who really believed that their children were protected. But the protection is um, really not at the level that one would expect by living in a smoke-free, tobacco pollutant-free environment. Okay, so uh, summary, um, we find um, third hand smoke to be highly persistent for years, for decades, pervasive and costly to remediate. We find it in low and high income homes. Um, we find it after smokers quit. We find it in dust and pillows and surfaces. We find it everywhere. We find it in smoke-free hotels, in used cars for sale, in rental cars, in a casino that bans smoking in hands of children as well as adults, including hospital staff. Uh, we find it in smoke-free movie theaters. Um, uh, Tom Northrup in Houston has done some remarkable work on neonatal intensive care units where, uh, the, where babies are visited by adults who may be smokers and leave behind transport into these NICUs and leave behind third and smoke residue. We find in smoke-free classrooms. We find it for a long time after people stop smoking. Cleanup costs are extensive um, and um, creating significant loss and resale value uh, throughout the industry. Um, Policy relevant differences, and I think this is where I think our next work really needs to uh, um, start. We need to figure out how can we update existing policies that focus primarily on secondhand smoke? How can we update them and expand them to include what we now know about third-hand smoke? So the first difference is they're pollutant reservoirs. Third-hand smoke is not just in the air, it's in objects, it's in dust, it's in surfaces. And um, just by adopting a smoking ban, um, we do not address the legacy, the physical chemical legacy that's left behind in the objects and materials in a particular environment that has been smoked in. Key difference too, the persistent time scale. Um, Secondhand smoke, we can ventilate out. Third-hand smoke, we cannot. Third-hand smoke stays around for weeks, months, years, and perhaps for the lifetime of a particular home or an apartment. Exposure routes. Third-hand smoke involves inhaling the re-emissions from the reservoirs, but it also involves ingestion and involves dermal transfer. So as we think of policies to remediate, policies to reduce, we need to keep in mind exposure pathways. Pollutant transport is really important, as you could see in the movie theater study and in the NICU study. Um, so we need to figure out how to address pollutant transport. Uh, remediation, um, we've done some remediation studies that, had, that showed short-term 
and limited effectiveness for surfaces that were cleaned, but because the reservoirs re-emit, the um, pollutants that were cleaned up and removed were quickly replenished. So in many cases, remediation really involves remodeling, rebuilding, and that means significant costs. And then different six, disposal. Uh, what do we do with a sofa that's full of carcinogens from tobacco smoke? What do we do with building materials um, that are um, left over from a remodel? Um, so I'm putting this paper um, reference again here because it's uh, this is a paper that was published just earlier this year and um, uh, discusses some of these implications in more detail. So what can we do about it? Close loopholes, that's the first thing. Indoor settings where smoking is allowed, but smokers are not present. Uh, we need to identify the loopholes like designated hotel rooms where smoking is allowed. The rental cars that allow smoking, workplaces that allow smoking like truck cabins, for instance, restaurants during the day, hookah bars at night. Closing loopholes, I think, is one of the first regulatory um, implications we need to pay attention to. Something that we've done in California for um, family daycare centers where smoking was allowed after hours when the children were gone. And um, I think this was back in 2016, uh, the policy was updated to ban smoking at any and all times in a home that serves as a daycare center. Uh, consumer education and protection. Um, third hand smoke is a consumer protection issue. Um, when people buy houses, buy cars, um, we need to make sure that um, consumers are advised about um, third hand smoke residue and um, um, that we establish ways for them to determine if indeed uh, a new home is uh, uh, indeed smoke free. We did a survey um, a, a couple of years ago to learn that California uh, Californians, at least smokers and non-smokers, really want to know whether people smoked in a home they're about to buy or rent. So consumer education, important issue, strengthening indoor smoking bans. This is a great argument why we need multi-unit housing smoking bans that are comprehensive and well implemented. Um, if you look at a home like this, um, it strikes me that this could and should be a housing code violation. And under California law, um, it might actually be, but it has not been applied in this particular context. And then finally, environmental impact disposal of uh, toxic and hazardous wastes. We need to figure out how um, tobacco polluted building materials, personal properties or so need to be properly disposed of, similar to the disposal of uh, computer screens and uh, light bulbs and uh, motor oil, for instance. And this is where I'm gonna end and I hope we have some time for questions. And I'm gonna leave you with on a humorous note um, and here it is. Thank you very much. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so much for taking us through this um, vast body of literature that you've contributed so much to. Uh, and you did it in a very accessible way and in a very I don't know, logical way. So thank you so much. We have some questions. Um, there are a couple of questions about remediation sort of before you address it. So maybe I'll put those to the side. We'll get, we'll, we can go back to them if there's time. Um, and maybe uh, Dr. Matt, I'll ask you to stop sharing your screen so people can have a good look at you. Um, so one, thank you so much. So one question is about, um, I guess the equivalent of third hand smoke related to e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products and if there's some um, early research in that area and what your hypothesis might be. The research that's been done on third hand smoke is primarily on combustion products because um, this is what the um, major concern was, and this is where we know the most about. So most research on 
certain smoke residue um, involves combustion products. Uh, having said this, uh, there is some new research that some of our colleagues have done on electronic cigarettes, and there are some important differences and there are some similarities. Let me start with the similarities. Similarities is, or one important similarity is that vaping products, most of them include nicotine. We know a lot about how nicotine behaves. Um, in environments. That is, it is super sticky. It absorbs at a very high rate. And this is what our research has, has uh, shown as well in the, in the study of 220 um, multi-unit housing units in San Diego County. There were several um, occupants who used electronic cigarettes, and we found nicotine levels in these homes at a similar rate. So if nicotine um, deposits and absorbs, it can transform into carcinogens through oxidation processes. Now, different from um, combustion products, e-cigarettes um, are uh, in, involve different chemical constituents, of course. So a lot of the pHs that we find in combustion products are not present or present at very lower, much, much lower levels um, in electronic cigarettes. Um, so so uh, the uh, composition is different and therefore the mixture of residue that's left behind is different as well. Now, electronic cigarettes have other compounds, including um, fragrances um, that leave behind residue um, that um, we do not yet fully understand. We can detect it in dust. So we see vanilla uh, re residue or uh, mint residues in some of the chemical analyses we do, but it is unclear um, to what extent this may uh, contribute to um, uh, hazardous levels or may interact with other compounds. So the research on e-cigarettes residue is ongoing. There are important differences that make me suspect that the, um, the um, toxicity of the mixture is lower than the toxicity of the mixture created by combustion cigarettes. Great. And just as, thank you. And just as a follow up question for heated tobacco products, would you, what would you expect with residue from use of those? I would expect those to be similar to vaping products, e cigarettes. Um, more similar than to combustion products because all the plant materials that are combusted at various temperatures just create a different um, chemical mixture and different potentials for uh, persistent residue. Great, thank you. So we have a question about um, more on residues. So the question is, could you say something about the concentration of residues in different contexts, and thus and thus the level of toxin exposure and risk, um, and how this might compare to secondhand smoke during actual smoking. So here is a, um, a hypothesis and a thought about secondhand smoke. My belief is that what we currently believe are the effects of secondhand smoke are really the combination of secondhand and thirdhand smoke. Because once you get exposed to secondhand smoke on a regular basis, you inevitably expose to thirdhand smoke as, as well. Um, now, having said this, there are environments where people are only exposed to thirdhand smoke. Uh, and those are interesting environments. But I think at the moment, we, we I think it would really be worthwhile to figure out um, uh, not just as an as an academic ac exercise, but what harm is being done by the exclusively by the inhalation of secondhand smoke, as opposed to, or different from the simultaneous exposure that takes place through air to skin deposition, as well as ingestion, as well as uh, you know exposure when the air is clean but people are sleeping in a bed that is and sitting on a couch and living in an environment and playing on the floor. 
of an environment that is uh, polluted with ferritin smoke. I think we'll find some interesting uh, differences here. Um, so, so the so so if we consider that secondhand smoke also includes certain smoke exposure, we don't really know what the exclusive secondhand smoke exposure uh, component is. Um, I think secondhand smoke exposure, as we currently think it, that includes certain smoke, is definitely going to be more harmful. But it only takes place over a short period of time. So we have not done the studies yet that that tease apart the issue of chronic exposure. If you're a child and you're living in a certain smoke polluted environment at the levels that we have observed, you end up with nicotine and other compounds on your hand at the levels that we've observed. You live there for 24 seven from the day you're born until you graduate from high school. Um, I think we will be surprised by what the impact is, but those studies have not been done, done yet. I think the exposure profile is so different and so unique that um, it's really important for us to do some serious field studies in addition to all the laboratory studies that have been done. That's really helpful. And I'm going to try and squeeze in one more question that follows from the scenario that you just talked about, which is a child exposed to third hand smoke. Um, do we know anything about whether those kids are more susceptible to nicotine addiction? Huh. You know, this is a question that um, I discussed with Mel Havel a long time ago. And what role, um, especially early life exposure, does to the sensitivity of nicotine receptors? Uh, we do not, I, I, do not, I do not know. Perhaps someone else does. But I think those are really important questions. What does a nicotine polluted environment do to the later susceptibility? Super interesting and important question. And I hope we'll, we'll get some smart people together to figure out how to uh, study this in a, in a longitudinal uh, study. That would be really important. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your expertise and insights with us on such an important topic. I know you ended off with a, a humorous slide, but this isn't a, such a humorous topic. It's um, There's a lot to be concerned about, and um, you did a super job just giving us um, a great sense of this body of literature. So, and And I think you know, you you being able to bring your sort of multidisciplinary perspective to this topic is also just adds so much. Um, uh, so thank you so much for uh, for this lecture. Really appreciate it, and um, thanks to everyone for joining.